as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. To each of us, each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fulfill, to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. When the Lord Jesus stopped the Paul on the journey to Damascus, he had two questions to ask. The first one was, who are you, Lord? And the Lord told him he was the one he was persecuting. But then his second question was, what shall I do, Lord? And thereafter, there was that total commitment by Paul in loyal service and willing obedience to the Lord. So when he says here, uh, I as a prisoner for the Lord, he might have well said, I'm a prisoner of the Lord, because the Lord Jesus had won his heart and his allegiance, and he was ready to serve him whatever the cost, and it certainly did cost Paul a lot. In fact, everything, as you think of the life that he lived, few, if any, suffered more than Paul did in their service for the Lord. But it was all for the blessing of others. He wanted other people to enjoy what he was enjoying. When he was writing to Timothy, he said, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So there he was ready to suffer. And here we meet him as a prisoner, physically restricted, but spiritually active with a deep concern for his spiritual children. In chapters 1 to 3 of Ephesians, we get a very rich exposition of our blessings in Christ, uh, revealing Paul's grasp of the divine purpose that uh, God had accomplished in Christ. As he says in chapter 3 and verse 11, he speaks about God's eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So Paul had a very good understanding of that. And... Uh, uh, it goes on in chapters 4 to 6 to give what he reckoned would be an appropriate response for others whose hearts have been won by the Lord Jesus and for Christ. So we have here the benefit of God's love to us, his love, his mercy, his grace, and now he's asking something back from us as a result. This is our favoured position in Christ enjoying God's goodness to us and it has brought about our response is brought about by our response to his calling you notice Paul uses the word calling a couple of times there in verse one and again in verse four 
and that opens up to us a, another great subject of uh, the, the call of God in our lives. It's lovely just to trace the scriptures through with that before us. It was something that was very precious to Peter. You remember how Peter five times over in his epistle spoke about the call of God and our response. Paul says here, uh, you are called to one hope when you are called. How thankful we are for the Lord Jesus, Paul said to Timothy, Christ Jesus, our hope. We live in a world that's hopeless just now, but here we are, we are blessed. He said to the Colossians, Christ in you, the hope of glory. What a difference it makes for us. Going back to Peter again, in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 10, he speaks about the God of all grace who has called us to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus. What a marvelous thing it is to have heard the call and responded to it as we seek to live out the kind of life that uh, God would have us. What I'd like to do now is really to focus on the one who has brought all this about. Paul touches so beautifully on the Lord Jesus there in verses uh, eight and eight downwards there. And uh, really, when you think of the words that we have here about the Lord Jesus as uh, descending and ascending, I, I think it's beautifully summed up in number 80 in our hymn book. It's just such a joy to, to sing that hymn about the Lord Jesus, twice as twice he who once descended more mad than men to be than men whom he befriended who pierced him on the tree. And then he goes back in verse on in verse uh, two, he says the second part, now thy love unbounded is flowing full and free and him thou hast surrounded with brightest majesty. And then he goes on to speak about the Lord coming back again for his own. Beautiful words, aren't they? But you just pause on that word there, he who descended. Paul set that out beautifully again in Philippians chapter 2, doesn't he? And just think of all that the Lord Jesus came to do. We were singing number five on Lord's Day morning. Well, may we wonder at the thought that Christ came down so low, that he so near to us was brought to understand our woe. Faber's hymn really touches my heart, sure it does your, yours too. Who can fathom that descending from that rainbow circled throne down to earth's most blas blas base blaspheming, dying, desolate, alone? How can you take it in? Who can fathom it from that Godhead's fullest glory? down to Calvary's depth of what a what a span of thought and meditation uh, these hymns bring to our minds sometimes we sing in the gospel was it for me for me alone the savior left his glorious throne came down into this world to die for us and we rejoice don't we it was for me yes all for me all oh, love of God so great so free another hymn I'm very fond of is 265, uh, speaking about the Lord Jesus as the, as the shepherd. Our Lord, his glory laid aside that he had known with God and came to earth as man and died to cleanse us by his blood. Good shepherd he, stray sheep he sought, stooped low and suffered loss. He bore the hiding of God's face, a curse on the cross. Who can fathom it? Paul just uses a few words here, but oh, what they, what they encompass as we think of our Lord Jesus coming to die for us on the cross. But then he says, he arose and ascended higher than all the heavens. Paul has already touched on that, hasn't he? At the end of uh, chapter one, where he speaks about God raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, 
not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So we rejoice, we delight, don't we? Another lovely hymn that we often sing at the remembrance, I'm sure you do too. Look, ye saints, the sight is glorious. See the man of sorrows now. From the fight returned victorious, every knee to him shall bow. God has crowned him. Crowns become the victor's brow. So we delight in the thought that the Lord Jesus is back in his rightful place at the right hand of the majesty on high. And so Paul says that he has given gifts to men, and that opens up a delightful list of things for us as well. Don't we delight in our salvation, our forgiveness, the gift of eternal life, and, and all the other lovely things that uh, go along with it? I was just thinking of the, the hymn 30 that speaks about the Lord Jesus. Uh, it says there in uh, verse 5, O wondrous gift! in whom we find then every heavenly gift combined. Our all in all is he, our life, our peace, our righteousness, all that we, sh that we have and shall possess, we have in him from thee. So we delight in the gifts that the Lord gives. But the focus that Paul is touching on him here seems to be more to do with what we might call the operational gifts that he gave in order that God's purposes might be fulfilled. And he lifts, lists them here, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, people that uh, God would use in the furtherance of his purposes in the building up of the body of Christ. You get more of these gifts mentioned in uh, Romans chapter 12 too, of course, where you get thoughts of operational gifts so that we can all work together and help each other along the way. We would uh, recognize, of course, that uh, the apostles were for a, a past age. We recognize that they were there for the foundation, as he mentions in chapter two. And the prophets too, well, we don't look for people who come and bring a fresh word from God that has never been spoken before we would say that prophets are forth telling, spelling out what has already been revealed. But the purpose of it all, he says, is to prepare God's people for works of service. You notice that there in verse 12. Paul has touched already in the great subject of works, hasn't he? Back in chapter 2, we often talk about verses 8 to 9 pointing out that salvation is by faith and not by works, lest anyone should boast. But then he goes on to say, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works that God has already prepared or prepared in advance for us. And it's a lovely thing, isn't it, when you rejoice in the salvation that we have and the gifts that God has given us, that we can go to him and say, Lord, I'm available. What do you want me to do? for you now. And he leads by his guidance into works of service for God's people. So he's talking about here the building up of the body of Christ. That's the objective for these people in operation. And so we ask ourselves, how does that happen? How, how can that be done? One of the answers, of course, is through the work of the evangelists that he has mentioned here. People reaching out, winning souls, uh, so that they will be baptized in the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ, there to dwell for all eternity. And so our task these days is to pray that God will raise up more evangelists because we have such a need of them. But it's a wonderful thing to think that how God does operate, uh, one of the things that has been very much before us at the moment in the Nigerian context is the, the vacation Bible courses that have gone on this year. There were nine of them all together, as well as a, a week of camp for young people, and then two weeks of teaching for disciples as well. 
And I marvel at this because it all started way back in 1962 when a boy heard the gospel and was challenged by it. The preacher asked the question that he asked of Hagar in Genesis 16, where are you going? That boy didn't rest until he got the answer to that through the preaching of Willie Stewart in 1964. And uh, when I arrived in Nigeria a bit later, he says, I got saved because a preacher came to school. Let's go to the schools. And that just started the thing that has rolled on and multiplied. And I wonder how many will be in heaven as a result of that preacher, an unknown man sowing seed. Uh, perhaps he knows better now. I'm sure he must be in heaven by this time himself. But uh, I was just recalling a very cultured young girl coming to one of the courses years ago and uh, she wanted to know how she could be saved. So the gospel was explained to her and she came back the next day and she says, I want you to know that I have received Christ as my savior. And these people would go on to live, many of them, for the Lord Jesus. And so the thing is multiplied, the seed is multiplied, the harvest is being gathered in. People saved and baptized into the body of Christ and we rejoice. There are no amputations from the body of Christ. There are no expulsions from there. But the second point that we could take out of this, the building up of the body of Christ, is to think of this as the edifying of the body, the spiritual nourishment, so that uh, we will grow. Paul was very keen uh, for his spiritual children to uh, go on to spiritual maturity. Uh, just as parents do, don't they, when they see little ones coming along and they, they want them to grow and develop. They don't want to be stuck uh, at any stage along the way. I was thinking of Epaphras. I, I love Epaphras in Colossians. Paul says he, he's laboring fervently for you uh, so that you might stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. And Paul had that same burden, that same desire. I don't know about you, but I find this is something very challenging for me as I think of all the, the folks I know in Africa particularly, but of course you can widen that to the, the whole fellowship and just say that it, it's great when we can just give ourselves to prayer on behalf of those folks who uh, know and trust the Lord Jesus. So what does this maturity look like that Paul is anxious about here? I think it takes us back to verses one to three, uh, because he's speaking there about being living a life worthy of our calling, being completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love, keeping the unity of the spirit and so on, making effort to do so. How would you sum up these verses? I think you'd just say Christ-likeness, Christ-likeness. I like what uh, Tony said at Alec Bartlett's funeral today when he was speaking about uh, the man's character. And Tony said, seeing a Christ-like person makes us think of Christ. Seeing a Christ-like person makes us think of Christ. And it's lovely when Christians love, uh, live the kind of life that uh, points to the Savior. I'm just listening to a somebody had downloaded there and the, the chap was talking about a man who got saved because he was impressed with somebody he worked alongside the character of the person drew him to the savior would that we could see more of that in our own lives it's it's got to do with conformity you remember paul said to uh, the romans in chapter uh, eight about god's purpose his foreknowledge and predestination so that we might be conformed to the image of his son and that's the great objective in the building up of the body of christ here in verse 14 he says that we'll be no longer infants tossed to and back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful uh, scheming Certainly plenty of people like that around these days. There's no, there's no uh, 
limit to them to the false prophets. I was looking for something on the internet the other day there, and uh, uh, I came across a website that gave us a whole list of false prophets who are out there in the evangelical world, and it's quite frightening really to think of probably a lot to do with the prosperity gospel people who are getting very rich at the cost of others. We won't go down that road. We won't worry too much about that. But thinking about no longer infants, it reminds me of First Peter chapter 2, where in chapter 1 he spoke about the new birth. And then he says, as newborn babies uh, long for the spiritual milk of the word, that you may grow thereby to salvation. Very interesting talking to people in our witness. I meet a lot of Roman Catholics and I make a point of asking them, do you read the Bible? And most of them will say no. I met one lady today. She says, no, but my mum does. <laughs> I'd love to meet her mum. <laughs> and so the objection is that we move on from being infants to growing up into spiritual maturity. Sadly, we have to say without being too critical, we, we can meet people who grow old but don't grow up spiritually. I'm thinking of a situation in Africa where spiritual immaturity really caused quite a lot of headache and heartache for brethren there. And it's something we need to challenge ourselves. Is my behavior uh, suitable? Uh, does it fit into this business of being conformed to the image of Christ? Do others see anything of the Lord in me? Paul had to tell off the Corinthians about this very thing, didn't he? He was quite blunt with them in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where he's saying that he couldn't address them as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you're not yet ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You're still worldly. For there is, since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? For when one says, I follow Paul and another... I follow Apostle, are you, uh, Apollos, are you not mere men? So it's a challenge, challenge isn't it? Uh, whether we behave in a Christ-like way or behave like spiritual children. It all depends, of course, on how we handle things. And you'll notice that the three times over Paul uh, speaks about love in the portion we've read here together. Love is obviously the great emphasis there in verse 2 and again in verse 15 and 16. When he was writing to the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 3, he said, we ought always to thank God for you brothers, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love every one of you has for each other is increasing. It's spiritual, spiritual maturity, so love and faith come into it, don't they? And of course we could add on to that other things as well. For example, Peter says, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's grace comes into this matter too. And so does faithfulness. Paul, uh, Peter was writing about Silas, whom he says, I regard as a faithful brother. And so we could make a list of things that we regard as indications of spiritual maturity. But the whole objective, of course, is that we grow up uh, in the body of Christ, working together and helping each other along as we encourage each other. Verse 16 of our chapter says, From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. It takes us, it takes us back to chapter 2 and verse 10, doesn't it? Lord, what would you have me do? That was where Paul was. We started there, didn't we? Lord, what do you, who, what shall I do, Lord? And it's a great verse to encourage young Christians to ask that question, and older ones as well, as we wake up and thank God for each day. Lord, what would you have me to do for you today? It happened to me today. Lorna asked me in the morning what I was going to do, and I I gave her a little list of things, and uh, what I, or I mentioned some things I thought about doing. But as the day went on and the sun began to shine, I felt rather uncomfortable in following my initial plans. And uh, 
I went out with some leaflets and knocked some doors and some lovely chats with folks too. So it's great to be available so that each part does its work in the working of God's purposes or going back to chapter 3 and verse 11, his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord.